Good evening. It is wonderful to see all of you here. Um, this should be a really fun evening. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, um, my name is Deb Marr, and I am a professor of ecology at Indiana University South Bend. I'm serving as moderator for the series of the Our Universe Revealed uh, lecture series. Um, this series includes talks in science, music, and the arts, STEAM for everyone. Um, we feature current research and creative work being done in our region, and it's an opportunity to be curious about ourselves, our world, and the universe. Um, this is a partnership between Indiana University South Bend, the University of Notre Dame, and also the St. Joseph uh, County Public Library, and we thank them for all their help in making these events happen. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Kyle Schweiderman. Uh, Kyle is a teaching professor in the Department of Mathematical Sciences at Indiana University South Bend. He earned his bachelor's and master's at, in mathematics education at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Um, and at IU South Bend, he teaches courses including um, elementary education math topic courses, courses in algebra, geometry, calculus, you name it, he goes all the way up. Um, seeing the beauty in math and getting excited about thinking through math problems can be a hard sell, especially if you've had bad experiences in previous math classes or just don't feel confident about your ability. Um, and Kyle has really excelled in bringing enthusiasm to his classes and helping students gain the confidence that they need so that they can see the beauty in math. And hopefully we will get a chance to do that tonight. Um, on campus, he's the director of the Math Tutoring Center and trains all of the tutors um, for the center uh, for the math. Um, and then in the community, he's the president of the board of directors for the Riverbend Community Math Center, whose mission is to promote interest and confidence in mathematics among people of all ages. And I'm just really excited to see the audience here. We've got all ages, and that's just wonderful. Um, Kyle mentors many new math teachers at all levels of education, from kindergarten, pre-kindergarten, all the way up to higher ed. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive into math and the beauty of folding. Well, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully I can live up to all of that. Um, I'm very excited to see the group today. I, you know, when you do these things and you sign up, you're like, oh, please, if I just get like 12 interested people, I'm going to be happy. And you blew me away. So I, I'm really appreciative of it. Um, and hopefully we can have some fun uh, learning about origami, learning a little bit about math, marrying the two ideas together, and maybe letting me be a little cheesy at the very end and give you kind of my dream for the future here um, as we fold one last piece after all the Q&A stuff. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so the, the, the title of my talk today um, is Behind the Folds, The Mathematics of Origami. Uh, I became interested in origami um, many, many moons ago, all right? Uh, I, was, I was a uh, young kid. Well, first off, this is the super pretty one. Here's the one I did, so we, we, we have that one. Um, my interest in mathematics goes way back to when I was single digits. Uh, I was growing up, mom and dad were starting to notice that I have a little bit of a tremor, okay? So if I'm up here and I'm a little drittery, it's not nerves, it's just I, I have a tremor, it's related to epilepsy and stuff like that. And um, the doctor was like, oh, Kyle would be perfectly fine, don't worry about him, but it would be great for him to work on his fine motor skills. So here are some things you could get Kyle to do to kind of improve those fine motor skills. And the very first thing my, the, the doctor said was that they should get me into sports. And um, for those who know me, you can laugh now, okay? <laughs> uh, that was absolutely not going to happen. I was the one, uh, true story, sitting in the backfield in the sand while during baseball writing equations in the, in the dirt because <laughs> I thought that was fun. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so after my parents were like, oh, that's not going to happen, w what else is there? Uh, he mentioned origami. And my love for origami started there where my parents took me to my local library, uh, checked out books about origami. I learned how to fold using those pages. Um, and then that carried me through higher ed where I got to marry those ideas with what I was talking about in grad school. 
And so hopefully today I can kind of give you a, a, a little bit of the love I have for both mathematics and origami, um, how I've connected the two, and uh, yeah, and then you get to take something pretty home. So there's always that uh, upside as well. Uh, so a little background, uh, we've all heard the phrase origami before. Um, as you can guess, it has, uh, an, it's from Japan. Um, it comes from the Japanese words to fold and for paper. Um, there, there are no hard and fast rules of origami. No one's really gonna like scream at you if you do something a little weird, a little different. But traditionally, origami is no cutting, and I did break that rule because you see half sheets in front of you, but typically it's no cutting and no gluing, okay? Th those are the kind of two no-nos of origami. Everything is just based off folding and putting it all together and making your final piece. Uh, it goes, it started around the seventh century. It was originally used for religious purposes. Paper was very expensive and very like boutique back then. Like only the fancy fancy could get it. And so they used it for religious ceremonies. Um, it wasn't until about the mid 1800s, the early 19th century, um, the person's name, I'm having a blank right now, but he was the one who kind of, uh, put together what we think of as elementary school now, K through six. He also liked origami. So he was the one who kind of put in some new inspiration and interest into origami. And that's when we really started to see it in popular culture and people started folding and making things that are not as sacred as the ones that were way back thousands of years or a thousand years before that. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go backwards. Uh, my interest in origami is primarily its educational applications. I like using it in the classroom and teaching certain concepts based off uh, origami. So I like the more simple, flat pieces of paper, easy angles to see, um, not as intricate, more traditional uh, origami folds. So I'm gonna start the presentation with the modern, because I'm not gonna have you do a modern fold, okay? Those, those are insane. Um, but I'm gonna start with the modern, go backwards so that we can actually follow along with me. Um, but origami has come a long way in the hundreds and hundreds of years um, that it has existed. I know nowadays we have to be all careful, like is this an AI generated image or not? No, this was actually folded. You can go on YouTube and you can find the person folding this in real time. He did it at the AMS, which is the American Mathematical Society. One of their conferences, he folded it live in front of everybody. His talent is insane. Um, the, the, the curves that he can get while folding is super impressive. Um, some other modern, um, origami artists slash mathematicians that I kind of want to shout out. And if during the Q&A stuff, if you want to talk more modern stuff, I will try my best. I, I know somewhat of what they're doing and the, the exciting things that are happening. Um, but these are the people that are kind of at the cutting edge and this is where origami is currently heading. Um, Thomas Hall is a huge inspiration for me. He, is, he focuses on the education side as well. Um, you can find a lot of like TED Talks and lesson plans online uh, that he has done centered around mathematics and origami. Um, Goran uh, Kenjavod, uh, he does these like really intricate tessellations pleated pieces. I'm not that great at pleats. Um, this, is, this is about as, as pleat as I can get. Um, so, so yeah, but they are, um, tessellations. So tessellations is a fancy math word for a repeating pattern that covers everything with no gaps or overlaps. Think like you go into a fancy bathroom and you look down and all the tile work down on the bottom, that's a tessellation. And so it's kind of this repeating pattern that is created while building these folds. I can do that, he can do the black one over here. Again, this is one piece of paper which kind of blows my mind, okay? Um, and the kind of planning that it takes, both from an artist's viewpoint and from a mathematician's viewpoint on is this possible and how will I do it, is just phenomenal. Um, Robert Lang is another big uh, role model for me. He's more on the math side than the education side. 
Um, but he's done a lot of great work. Uh, his, one of his most famous pieces is called The Cuckoo Clock. You can Google it. It didn't make it to uh, mine, but uh, it's made from one piece of paper. It's astounding. Um, Jun Makawa, he is the one who did this elephant. Again, single piece of paper. Uh, he kind of got cut out when I put the slides together, but he's sitting right here. So this thing is ginormous, all right? It's a huge piece of paper. Um, it took months and months of planning uh, what he was going to fold and how everything was going to fit together. Uh, but he was able to put that. Um, and then the last one, Saifo Mbana, uh, has done a lot of work publishing um, about the mathematical topics in here. And obviously, since these are more modern pieces and modern ideas, you have to take a ton of math classes to really start to like chip away at what they're doing. Um, so I more just wanted to start to show you kind of the grandeur of how far this can go. Um, and then we'll build the foundations from there. Uh, some of the applications that uh, origami is being used for right now is uh, origami can be used to describe, obviously, like geometry. We all kind of think, yeah, the, the study of shapes, that makes sense. Uh, but there are applications beyond in like linear algebra and calculus and uh, matrices and all that kind of high school math words that you may have heard before um, are being currently used today. Uh, so paper products with no adhesives, uh, making it more recyclable, kind of putting it together, folding maps and other documents, unfolding space telescopes and solar sails, airbag packaging, um, self-organizing artificial intelligence systems. Uh, I know AI is the hot button topic right now, so I included that one. But again, this is not my forte, okay? If you, if you ask, I can give you a brief, brief summary of how origami is being used to kind of teach AI how to organize itself. Um, but if you want more specifics, you're going to have to email me, and I'll have to Google a lot more to give you a good answer there, okay? Um, but yeah, so some pictures of these applications. Um, so Boston Electronics is using origami with these tiny little mini bots. Uh, they start as a flat sheet of paper, just like you have in front of you. Um, and what this does is it introduces heat into the material they have that's playing with the that's playing the role of paper. And that heat causes it to fold up along the creases that we would traditionally with a flat piece of paper. And we create a little robot like this, and it can move around. And so it starts flat, and it folds up. So we can kind of introduce origami when there's not even fingers touching it anymore, which is pretty neat. Um, NASA has been using origami for years. It's very, uh, origami kind of gives us an idea of how to efficiently pack something in the smallest amount of space possible while still efficiently blowing up to what it needs to become once it's outside of our atmosphere. Um, so solar sails, that type of deal, um, origami has been used. Uh, Robert Lang has done a lot of stuff with NASA and doing that kind of deal. Um, and then this is another example where uh, the integrity of the bulletproof material you can't do every single type of fold with it. It will kind of like not stop what it needs to stop if you do bad things to it. So they needed to come to some um, origami specialists to figure out how you can take this shield and collapse it down. Again, save space, but still maintain that integrity. So origami is being used in a wide variety of uh, different situations um, that you might not expect having the kind of understanding of, oh, yeah, I can make a pinwheel or something like that. It can go all the way up to something crazy like this. Okay. Okay. These are some, this is where like the math and the art starts really marrying together. Um, and what mathematicians have done with origami for the past 100 years or so is we like to fold things up. So here is a, a traditional crane, OK? We like to fold things up. And mathematicians, being mathematicians, they're like, yeah, that's great. That's pretty. I want to break it apart again. And I want to see what it looks like on the inside, OK? So we'll unfold it. And when we unfold it, we get these kind of framework patterns that you see up on the board here. And a lot of the mathematics I kind of tackled in graduate school is what kind of patterns are um, feasible? 
What can you make? What are the rules behind these frameworks? And it's gotten to the point where we look at these kind of crease patterns, and you can actually go on eBay and find them signed by certain origami artists, and they will send you a sheet of paper, a very expensive sheet of paper, that has been folded and signed by one of the artists. And so mathematicians have been looking at these crease patterns and going, okay, what's a rule? What works here? What doesn't work here? How far can we take this? Okay. All of these are some famous designs by Hull, um, kind of distinct animal patterns. You can see how intricate the different designs can be. Right. And we kind of look into what works and what doesn't. Right. So with that, I've talked a little bit. Let's do a fold to talk about what works and what doesn't with origami. Okay. Now, this first fold, we get prettier as we go on. Okay. This first fold, you're not making something that you're going to want to put on your fridge at home. This is going to be just like a, eh, okay, I'm just folding a piece of paper. But we are all going to take that, there I am, that solid colored piece of paper that's in front of you. We're going to take that. And we're going to play pretend a little bit. Actually, I'm not going to play pretend. I have tools up here. I'm going to use a pencil, or I'll steal your pen. But we're just going to choose a point on your square piece of paper. It doesn't matter where. I'd recommend towards the center. We're just going to play pretend and just choose a point. I'm just showing you visually, but you can point at it. You're like, OK, I have a point right here. This is where I'm playing with it. And then what we're going to do, once we've chosen our point, is we're going to fold a line through that point. It doesn't matter what line you create. It could be all the way through the piece of paper. It could be partially through the piece of paper. You're just folding. Just for a visual aid so you can see it up here, this is where my point is still. I'm going to fold again through that point. And again, it's wherever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be beautiful. But my point is still at that corner, kind of at the vertex, if you want to use a mathy word. And you can do it one more time. You can stop here if you want. You can do whatever you want. Kind of look at that. There you go, another fold. But the kind of whole point is that there is a point to my fold. There's that original point that I chose. I'm just folding so that point is always in the center of my fold. Once you've folded it about as much as you want, again, we're not doing anything pretty today or not right now, we'll do pretty stuff later. We're going to unfold it. We're going to look at the crease pattern. And the thing that I am most interested in is how many mountains do you have and how many valleys do you have? And what do I mean by mountains and valleys? Well, if you look at my piece of paper, this fold right here is a mountain fold because it kind of sticks out a little bit. Well, the one right next to it is a valley fold because it goes down. So the question is, how many mountain folds do you have? How many valley folds do you have? Once you count them up, some volunteers to let me know. Yeah. I got three mountains, five valleys. Three mountains, five valleys. Love that number. Yeah. Two mountains, three valleys. Two mountains, three valleys. Might be missing one. <laughs> It does. So it will just flip flop like how many mountains and how many valleys. So like three to five, five to three. Five mountains, three valleys. Anybody else want to share? <laughs> yeah. Two mountains, four valleys. Love that. Okay, let's do one more. Anybody want to be bold? Yeah. 
five mountains, two valleys, there might be one more valley. Three valleys, there you go. <laughs> See, that's the magic, right? That's the math in my brain. Like, how did I know there might be one more? A rule of crease folding is that the difference between the number of mountains and the number of valleys is always two. Okay? It's been proven. It was proved in the 60s, okay? Um, where this absolutely has to be the case. And the way we prove it, I did bring scissors today, but I'm not going to you know, go crazy, is we kind of fold it up. I can't remember how I folded it up now. But we kind of chop that off, and we look at the flat shape that's created. It's called a polygon. And we kind of add up all the angles. We look back and forth. Some of my geometry students are shaking their hands like, yeah, OK, we're talking about polygons right now. He's probably going to bring this up this next week. And I will, OK? But we chop it off. And we can kind of see that as we go around a polygon, that equals 360 degrees. And each fold is a 180. So a mountain fold is you're going this way, and now you're going this way. Or a valley fold is going this way and this way. So since it's 360, and each mountain and valley is 180, that means there has to be a difference of two so you can make your way around the polygon. Okay? So this is how mathematicians kind of play around with things. We look at real basic things. We don't start with. I got to show off my folds here. We don't start with beautiful little dragons, OK? We don't like, oh, OK, let's, let's play with the dragon and figure that out. No, we look at the more baser units, and we kind of really try to build up from what we can, they're called axioms. Like, this is the way math works. And then we just kind of glue some of those axioms together, create something called a theorem. This is Makawa's theorem, that the difference between mountains and valley folds have to be two. I promise the next ones will be prettier. Okay. All right. So yeah, so once we kind of build up these axioms and we can kind of build everything together, we can now put them into a computer program. And now we don't even have to put human hands on it anymore. We can kind of say, yeah, this is totally possible. This is how it would look. All right. Now, all that modern stuff is really cool, and obviously I, I'm really interested in it from an academic standpoint, um, but from an actual, like, I'm going to make it myself standpoint, I am way more interested in something called modular origami. So this is something that I worked with with my uh, thesis advisor, Dr. David Meal at Bowling Green. Modular origami is the art of folding something like this by putting multiple pieces of paper together. The two rules still apply. There was no cutting, and there was no gluing of putting this together. This is just folds and then putting pieces of paper together and letting friction do its thing. And ta-da, it's now one solid polyhedra. So the art of putting multiple pieces together is modular origami. And you can use anything from five or six pieces. So this is real tiny, but this is just a tiny little cube I created with six pieces of paper. And then you can keep going up and up and up. My favorite is the 30 pieces. Okay, So this is 30 pieces of paper put together. Right. Obviously, you can go nuts. Okay, <laughs> We can keep going. I did build the 270 with Dr. Meal back in the day, but he got to keep it because he's my advisor. Okay, so <laughs> I, I've never since then built a 270 myself. It was a lot of work. Okay, um, but there are all these. You just kind of fold the same thing over and over and over again, and then you piece them together, kind of like Legos. Okay. And obviously, the kind of well, the math behind it, the curiosity pieces about it, is. Well, this is how to fold one of the units. I'm going to skip folding one of these units. I was going to have you all fold it and then give you homework to do 29 more at home. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, but I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to brush over that one. Um, if you want to learn more, this is the Sonobe unit, S-O-N-O-B-E. The great thing nowadays that I didn't have when I was nine is YouTube and TikTok, OK? Those are so much easier to follow 
a fold when someone's showing you it in video form than it is to read those books. The, the books, it's like learning a language. You have to learn, okay, this kind of hash means it's a valley fold and this kind of hash means it's a mountain fold. And this means that this is the pretty side of the paper. This is the not so pretty side of the paper and you're putting it together. Uh, but yeah, but this is a Sonova unit. But putting these all together, I started to generate all these kind of questions that I had, that I was like, okay, what are, what are some neat things that I can do with this modular origami? A lot of these involve a branch of mathematics called color theory, which is kind of like, how many crayons do you need to color the picture? And so you can see, using two colors, is it possible to construct a cube so that both colors appear on each face? So again, I'm building this little cube out of six pieces of paper, can I do it with two colors and each color show up on each face? Who knows? And so I had to experiment, play around. It is possible. Right? Using three colors, is it possible to construct a cube so that only two of the three colors appear on each face? Okay. So on and so forth. It's kind of these inspired questions that I started taking all these different colors and putting them together to see how many of one I needed and how many of one of another I needed to kind of construct the, the image that I wanted. <coughs> so now these questions of how many pieces do I need, how many of each color, all this kind of deal just inspired from this original love of origami that I never thought I would use in a math class. And now I'm kind of marrying the two ideas, which is the cool thing about graduate school. With these, the Sonova unit is the traditional one. Okay, this is the one where you get like this little yellow piece right here is just one piece of paper. Okay. And you kind of get the solid colors everywhere. But there are a million variations to it. For example, this one, I kind of use the not so pretty side of the paper, the white side of the paper to create these little like, I don't know, Nike swooshes in a way, okay, all over the piece. So this is one I constructed in college. Okay, I just played around with it and said, yeah, this is now the Kyle unit, and now it's the Kyle unit. Okay. <laughs> but as you can see on the screen, there's a whole lot more that people have created and designed and put together. And all you have to do is play around with it. To me, mathematics is just a, I'm gonna kind of steal a quote, uh, but Mathematics is just a sandbox, and I get to kind of build what I want from it by just playing around. Another kind of modular um, origami variation is Thomas Hall. Again, he's a big kind of role model for me. Him being like the leading math ed origami expert, he had to come out with his own unit. Okay. And he didn't call his the Tom unit, or like I called it by the Kyle unit. He called it the Fizz unit. And so the Fizz unit gives us this kind of neat, kind of lattice framework. Um, fizz stands for pentagon, hexagon, zigzag. And so when you put these together, you'll see that it forms pentagons inside the framework. Okay. I could also build it so there would be hexagons. It would be a bigger one then. But those are the two shapes that it creates. I'm a big Redditor. I'm on the origami subreddit, of course. Okay. So this is someone else on Reddit using the fizz unit and kind of the, the, the color spectrum to build this shape here, where you can definitely see the pentagons. In here, this is not a hexagon. They, they kind of, they, you have to twist it a little bit. You have to like do, make it do something it doesn't want to do to make this loop, but that's okay, okay? Again, with origami, there's really no hard set rules. It's just how you want to do it. And with the fizz unit, we can create all kinds of new neat toys. Um, the fizz unit, I once read a paper that they were using it to strengthen some sort of alloy. Again, outside of my realm of expertise, I'm more education. But it is a strong lattice, okay? So it could be used for that. 
But modular origami, the idea of just putting multiple pieces of paper together to create something new, is again my kind of major uh, uh, interest. Uh, if you want more things to Google, okay, because I can't have you do all of these in today's presentation, uh, a kusadama is another kind of modular origami where you get this kind of spiky, almost, uh, we called them cootie catchers in elementary school where you make those little uh, fortune teller things. They're kind of like 30 of those glued, not glued together, like slapped together to create this. This one, I made a bunch of little, like, little Vs. You put them all together. I believe this is 12 units. But again, it's kind of just, I started with this idea and then used a little bit of math to say, okay, this is how many pieces I need, and then put it all together. So in graduate school, I was dealing with modular origami. But then when I got my job here at IU South Bend, I primarily teach future teachers. And so my interest switched a little bit to more educational applications of origami. How can I use origami to bring down some barriers in a math class, to alleviate some anxiety in a math class, to have students have some fun and learn something along the way? There's a lot of research behind the educational application of origami, all the great things that it does. The number one thing is it helps improve something called spatial reasoning. Spatial reasoning is this kind of skill that uh, pretend like you look at something like my, uh, let's do kangaroo, okay? Spatial reasoning is the ability to kind of look at this and then like rotate it in your head, like kind of close your eyes and and you're able to kind of move it around a little bit and see what the top and bottom would be and kind of this kind of just sense of 3D space. Right? And spatial reasoning has been shown to really be like a great indicator of how successful a student will be in their STEAM classes, all right? Science, technology, engineering, art, mathematics. All these really high need kind of professions really depend on spatial reasoning. And one thing that has been found over and over again is, is that there's a huge gap in spatial reasoning ability when it comes between genders and different races and ethnicities and really trying to bridge that gap using geometry. Okay. But I use it to teach fraction multiplication, uh, problem solving fine motor st skills like my doctor did 30 years ago. Um, it's very calming, it reduces stress and anxiety, and it promotes creativity and critical thinking. Right. So let's do some of this creativity, reduce anxiety, let's actually make something fun that we can bring home and show off to our friends. Okay. So I call this my surprise fault. Okay. Now, my geometry students in here, they already did this one. So they know what this is going to be. But when I do this in the classroom, I don't like to say what it's going to look like at the end. Okay? Some people are fine with that. Some people, like me, very type A, like, no, tell me the rules first so I can figure it out and make it prettier later. Um, I did cut out 50 of these, didn't think there was going to be as many of you. I was like, oh, I have extras if you want to fold it again. But this is just a square piece of paper cut in half. So you can build one at home. Or I'll tell you, the kind of best ratio is um, a dollar bill. So you can do this with a dollar bill in the future, too. Um, and you'll make something really cool out of it. Okay? But we're going to do something. Uh, you don't know what you're going to make. All right? So you're just going to have to trust me. And I know you've only known me for 30 minutes, but it's OK. I'll, I'll take you step by step. And what we're going to do with this kind of tall, skinny rectangle is you're going to do like I did up here. You're going to take the pretty side face down. And you're going to make the tall side be going out from you. Now, I'm going to take the right side of my rectangle, and I'm going to fold it over to the left side of my rectangle, doing what we call real technical a hot dog fold. Okay, Make a little hot dog bun. 
Not to put too much stress on it, but the first couple of folds in an origami piece are typically the most important, okay? So the more precise that you can get it, the better it will be. So we fold it in half, and then I am unfolding it again, because really all I need to know is where that middle half is. So fold it in half, unfold it again, pretty side still face down. Excellent. The next thing we're going to do is now called a book fold. We're going to take the right and left hand sides and fold them towards the center. So now instead of splitting in half, we're going to split it in fourths. But I'm going to take that right side, fold it towards the center, left side, fold it towards the center. It's better to be under than over. But now I've got an even skinnier rectangle with the pretty pattern on both sides. Okay. When I do this in the classroom, I typically have 20 people. So don't be afraid to raise your hands and say, hey, I'm, I'm lost, I'm stuck. Okay. Okay, now with that rectangle, we have it seam side up. That means the fold that we just did is facing us. This is when you're gonna to have to start putting a little of your own artistic flair in it. This is not gonna be just a halvesies thing anymore. So you're just gonna to have to kind of again, trust the process and look at me and see what's going up here. This one, I would suggest watching me do the whole thing before starting yourself. I'm going to look at the top of my rectangle. Again, this is seam side up. My kind of middle seam is right here. I'm going to look at the top of my rectangle and about a pinky size. I'm going to fold this back. So I'm going to take this top part about a pinky size and fold it towards the back. So all I've done is really kind of shorten my rectangle a little bit, but now this top is like sewn together. I can't get into it anymore. So again, one more time, I'm taking the top, about a pinky side, folding it back, and that is that fold. Yeah. The sh I, t I use my nails to kind of make it, and I know it's very difficult if you don't have a table, um, but you should be fine just kind of pinching it together. It should be all right. Yeah, the people without tables, you, you are the heroes right now. There is a table up here if you want to kind of steal it. Okay. All right. Now, again, the top is kind of the sewn shut. I kind of think of it as like a tube of toothpaste. I like twirled it up a little bit. The, the top is the sealed part. The bottom is still kind of open. Again, I'd recommend watching before doing. I'm gonna examine the top right and left corners and I'm gonna fold them towards the center. However, I'm not going to do like a paper airplane fold. I am not going to do this kind of 45 degree angle and make like a, a little arrow thing here. Instead, I'm gonna make it shallower. I'm gonna fold it towards here to kind of, let me put a different color behind it. Mm -hmm. So I kind of get this like long skinny triangle. And whatever you do to the left side, you should try to replicate it on the right side. To make it as congruent as so it's not fully becoming a point. Bless you. You're kind of making a doll pencil on the top. Okay. Trying to make it towards the center. 
you need help, I can do one, and then you can try to copy the other. Make it towards the center, kind of like that. Okay. This one, that there, and then what I'm gonna do is like this, and like this. No, you're good. There you go. Just like that. <laughs> Anybody else want support? We okay? It's looking great. Looking great. If you feel like you got it, you can obviously share it with the people around you. Excellent. Okay, cool. All right. So, two more folds. The bottom, this kind of open side. I'm going to go about halfway up my rectangle. And now I can take my paper airplane inspiration and really fold out those wings. So I'm taking the center and I'm folding it out as much as I can. So I get these kind of flat triangles that spread out from the center. I don't think this fold has a specific name, but it's always reminded me of high school biology class and all the dissections I had to do, okay? So I call it the dissection fold, all right? Yeah. I miss this Anybody else want support? Okay, we're only one fold away from the final product. Anybody want to guess what you think it's going to be? Who hasn't done it before? <laughs> Cal hasn't done it before. Do you want to guess? I've done it before. Oh, you have done it before? Okay. Anybody want to guess that hasn't done it before? It's true, but you've seen it before. I have. Okay, let's do the last fold. I'm going to take this bottom side and I'm going to fold it up kind of in half. I'm going to tuck it underneath the little flaps I have up here and I create a cute little collared shirt. Okay. The way I use this in the classroom is a nice introduction of polygons. We talk about all the different shapes that exist within the shirt, the different angles, how some sides are parallel, some sides aren't. Talk about ideas of congruent and regular. All these things that have like math definitions to them, but I use origami to make it more real, to make them be able to play with it, touch it, feel it, improve their sense of spatial reasoning, and they get to take something cool home. Excellent. All right. Okay. So um, I do have one more fold, uh, but I wanted to pause for any questions first before I go on to the last fold. So there is one more slide. Uh, but um, I will field any questions you have about math or gummy, how I use them, how I marry them together. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, um, ChatGPT can tell you kind of what's a legal fold and what's not a legal fold. So there are certain things, for example, uh, Dr. Lang has proven that you can create animals with certain numbers of appendages using origami. So if you go into chat GPT, it's like, can I make an animal with 21 legs? It'll say no, but 22 legs, it'll say yes. So it can like tell you what's valid, what's not, but it cannot, it's not at the point yet where it creates a 3D model for you and say, hey, here's the, the crease pattern and go from there. So 
but I haven't played with it too much. I've been more worried about, you know, my students using it to write papers, not, you know, create origami folds. So, uh, so yeah, so maybe it's a, it's a little bit more than that, but I do know that it's been trained in what's legal and what's not when it comes to actual origami folds. Any other questions? Yeah. Are they, as far as you know, are medical devices being done with origami? I could see folding something up really small, getting it into a body part, and then expanding it. Is that being done? Yeah. So one of the most basic, like, foundational units for origami is called a water bomb. Um, so it's this kind of fold, again, one single piece of paper, where you start with something flat, but then there's going to be a little hole at the end, and you blow into it, and it blows up like a balloon. And that kind of idea has been used in a lot of medical devices to kind of get it in and go from there. Anything that we're concerned with, like, efficiency and packing, origami has a place in it somewhere. Um, but, yeah, but the water bomb unit I know definitely has been used uh, for medical purposes. You got a question, Sol? Yeah. Um, what is the smallest origami can basically make? Like, what is the smallest? Uh, yeah, so the, the sky's kind of the limit with, with that. Uh, it, the, the question was, um, what's the kind of smallest uh, you can make with origami? Like, what's the kind of smallest end product? And it really just kind of depends on, obviously, the starting size of the piece of paper. Um, I destroyed one of my cranes up here already, but here's a tinier one. So, so yeah, so like it, it, that kind of deal is um, uh, what you start with can obviously have a big effect. Um, some of you may have heard the kind of uh, urban legend myth-ish that you can only fold a piece of paper on itself seven times and then you can't do it anymore. Um, that's not 100% true. It's just you need a really strong squisher, OK? Um, so I am not that strong squisher. But given, like, if you're using, if it's machine assisted, you can go nuts with those and, and kind of go from there. Um, as far as the smallest I've seen, uh, I've seen videos of, I forget who the artist was, but he was using tweezers to, to do folds. That is not me, OK? That is. Yeah. Shaky hands McGee over here would never do uh, tweezers in a fold. Um, but yeah, but it can get quite minute. Uh, the biggest I've seen was the elephant, the, the picture I showed you there. That's like one of the bigger ones I've ever seen. Um, but obviously the solar, the, the NASA applications, the solar sails, those are even bigger than that. So it can kind of just, I think the sky's the limit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So the question was, it, does origami rules uh, apply to protein folding? And so I get to plug one of my favorite books. Um, so I'm glad you asked that. All right, so we are in the library. Books are my thing, so I, I have to plug in one book. Um, I don't have an Amazon affiliate link, so I'm not getting any money for this. It's fine. I'm just telling you, you should definitely look at it. Um, one of my favorite books is by Thomas Hall. It's called Project Origami, and it's these a, a bunch of these, like, problem solution type situations where he introduces an idea and then he uses origami to solve it. Um, one of the like, I, I'm off topic, I'll get back. One of the, one of the problems of antiquity, okay? There were, there were three problems. Oh, actually, I have to go back a little bit more. Okay, pretend we're all in high school geometry. And we did all of these things with a straight edge and a compass, OK? We had to bisect an angle, and we had to build all these things. And what, uh, the ancient Greeks were dealing with that stuff. But one of the things that just made them like go nuts is we can bisect an angle. We can split it in half. But how do we trisect an angle? That should be doable. Like we, It should be easy enough. They just couldn't figure it out. Frustrated them for years. And it wasn't until the 1800s that we proved algebraically that it's not possible. You cannot trisect an angle with a straight edge and compass. But you can with origami. Okay? You can trisect a, an angle using origami, using kind of congruent triangles, and you build it all together. Um, so there's some push to like replace straight edge and compass with origami in high school because it's, it has a broader application. But the question was protein folding, and hopefully I can find it here soon. Um, but there is applications to like helixes and genetics, and I'm sure that kind of builds along to there. 
Uh, I can't find it. He does a really cool fold. It, it possibly is, but um, but yeah, the the answer is yes. Um, there are different ways that we can model those kind of. Yeah, I would have to look, but you can. No, well, that's not exactly it. But yes, there there are ways that that we can model uh, protein folding with with origami um, to kind of give us a, a more general sense of how. Any others? In high school, and whether you jump too fast or not, for extra credit, the price that they came up with a compass and straight edge came up. And I was told by the instructors, and nobody figured it out, that there was a 40 page thesis or something that somebody wrote that proved it could be done. I, I'm pretty sure it was proven that it can, like, it can't be done. Um, I believe it was in like the mid to late 1800s. Um, I would have to look at it a little bit more. I know, like, I know how to do it with origami, um, but I'm pretty sure. So, like, the three questions of antiquity that, that the Greeks just went nuts over were how to trisect an angle, how to double a cube. So, get a cube. How do you construct a cube with double the uh, the volume, and how to square a circle, uh, where you get a circle and then you construct a square that has the same area as the circle. Um, and all of those were kind of pondered for a long time. Um, some of them have been proven like, yes, we can do it this way. Uh, but I believe the trisecting with just a straight edge and compass, just those two tools, I do not believe is possible. Um, they might have introduced a third tool and it might not have been origami. Uh, but. But yeah, I believe that you would have to introduce a third tool to that. Okay. All right. So this last fold um, comes with a story. Uh, so I get to be a little, little cheesy here. Um, but some of us may have heard this story before. Uh, but it's uh, the story of Sudoku and the thousand cranes. Um, and origami cranes are a symbol of peace in Japanese culture. Uh, whenever anybody does origami, a crane is typically one of the first things they do. I remember it was one of the first things I created. Um, and there's this story about Sudoku Sasaki. Uh, she was young, young, young. She was like three uh, when uh, the bombing on Hiroshima happened. And because of that, uh, because of that, the, the bombing, she was diagnosed with leukemia when she was a teenager. Okay? And so she was in the hospital, and she, the, the legend kind of goes that she was told by a friend about the, 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 the legend of folding cranes. And she was told that if she could fold a thousand cranes, your heart's desire would come true. This has been an urban legend in, in, in Japan for a very long time. And so she was like, OK, I'm going to do this thing. I'm spending a lot of time in the hospital, unfortunately. So I'm going to just spend that time folding 1,000 cranes. And she started folding them with her main heart's desire to be better, to, to be healthy. Um, however, the story goes, as she was in the hospital, um, she started to see how others were suffering. And she changed her wish from ending her suffering to ending all suffering. The popular myth is that she only made 644 cranes before passing. It's not confirmed. She was, she was a real person. We just don't know how many cranes. Um, and this story became more and more popular. Now there's two major monuments to her. This is the one in Japan. And this one is actually in Seattle, Washington. And every year, both of them are inundated with millions upon millions of folded cranes. Okay. Estimates are about 10 million. So what I'll do, and I'm kind of ruining the end of the semester to my geometry students here. Um, the, the, the geometry class I teach um, is the third in a series of three courses. So they've seen my face for three semesters by that point. And at the very end of geometry, I have all of my students fold a crane with me. And then I keep track of how many cranes in total I've done on campus. Right? I'm over 700 right now. Right? 
And my major heart's desire, okay, as, as, as you know, lame as it's gonna sound, is I'm very passionate about math education. Okay? I know that a lot of people, maybe people in this room, have that kind of math trauma, math anxiety, it kind of builds up, it's kind of like, ah, I'm just scared of math. I have heard time and time again, I'm not a math person, I can't do this, my parents weren't math people, I did not get that blood type, like I, I don't know what's going on. And it's unfortunate that a discipline that's brought me so much joy can bring so many other people pain. So my heart's desire is that we can change the educational culture here, which helps because I deal with mostly education majors, and turn math classrooms into a place where it's okay to take risks and play around and be creative and see what happens and just say, hey, I'm going to create a little Nike swoosh and I'm gonna call it the Kyle unit. Why? Because it's fun, all right? And so my heart's desire is to create that kind of math classroom. So I know I'm getting towards the end of my time. Um, so if you don't have time to follow along with the crane fold, that's okay. Um, is there things you wanna say before? Okay, okay. 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 Um, but yeah, but if you want to say I can do a crane fold with all of you, and the kind of incentive is I will add you to my total. Okay, so you can, you can officially be a part of the Kyle total when I get to 1,000. Uh, you'll know the day because you'll wake up and the news headlines will say math classrooms change forever, <laughs> okay? Uh, but yeah, so if you wanna stay and, and do the swan fold with me, or the crane fold with me, um, you definitely can. I will say it's, I wouldn't say it's intermediate, but it's not the easiest fold in the world. There's, there's quite a few steps to it, but I will go slowly, uh, so, uh, so yeah, so. Do you want me to start or you want to plug the next one? Yeah, I'll just plug the next one real yeah. quickly and then people, if you, if you can stay, stay, and if you need to go, go. Um, so the next talk actually has come up a little bit tonight, so nice foreshadowing. Uh, so on Tuesday, March 5th, our next talk is going to be about artificial intelligence. So uh, Victoria Woodard um, is going to talk about, so uh, we have information that's being gathered every day and then artificial intelligence and algorithms are being used to use that information. So you, they will then pitch to you advertisements that are tailored towards you. Um, and so the question is, what is, uh, how is this artificial intelligence working? How does Jet, chat GPT actually work? And then also, how can you make yourself a little bit safer from some of the dangers that that can bring forward? So anyway, if you want to join us Tuesday, March 5th, that's coming up. And hold the crank. Excellent. <laughs> Also, if you want to fill up feedback as well, you can do that if you're going to go. But we can fold the crane. All right. So if you want to follow along, I'm taking the um, patterned piece of paper right now. If you want to do a solid piece of paper, it's the same. It's totally fine. Um, but to do the crane, um, you have to start with a square piece of paper. Instead of doing a hot dog fold, we're going to do a taco fold. And you can probably guess what a taco fold looks like. But I'm going to start with the pretty side up. And I'm going to take my bottom corner, bottom right, to my top left. And I create my taco. I'm going to undo that and do it the other way. So I'm gonna create an X on the front side of my paper. So I'm gonna open it up, fold the taco the other way. So bottom left to top right for me. And now, I have a big X in the middle of my piece of paper. I'm gonna flip it around so now that the solid color side is showing. 
and I'm going to do two hot dog folds. So I'm going to create a cross on top of my X. Right. So I'm going to take my bottom, fold it up to the top. Undo that and take my left and fold it to my right. So a whole bunch of work to just have, you know, a bunch of lines in my piece of paper. A lot of base origami units kind of start with this. We're doing this to kind of see where half is, where a quarter is. The reason I had you flip back and forth is because when we put it together, the folds are going to play more nicely, given the different ways that we folded it. Okay, the next part I would watch before doing. I'm going to start with my paper oriented like this. Talk to one of my students after this to see why that's not called a diamond. Okay? <laughs> it's a square, just rotated 45 degrees. But this, I'm going to kind of push in. So we, we start with this kind of tinier square down here. I'm going to push these in so it kind of collapses on itself to create a tiny version of the piece of paper. I'll do that again and slowly. So I'm starting with this square so that the point is at me. I take the right and left corners and I fold them in towards the bottom. And because of the way we kind of fold it back and forth, it should kind of collapse to make that shape there. I think I have that exact one up there somewhere. Just there you go. <laughs> Years of practice, it's just. Excellent. OK, the open side is going to be down towards us, and the pointed side is going to be out away from us. You'll see that there are kind of two layers to this now. I have the front square, and then there's a back square to it, too. I'm just going to deal with the top layer. So I'm kind of putting my fingers in the middle here. But I'm going to take this left side fold it towards the center just like you would with a paper airplane so that that bottom line totally lines up with the center fold. And I do the same thing to the right. So I'm taking this side, taking that corner, folding it towards the center. Lining it up. If you feel confident with that one, you can then flip it over and do the same thing to the back side. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it, that happens all the time. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, you won't even see it in the final product. Okay. Yes. Nope, we're good. So we collapse it this way. And then towards the center there. And I've got to kind of copy that three more times. I know. I need to catch up to something, huh? Yeah. 
And now we've got this kite. <laughs> the next fold I'm going to do is kind of just to give myself a crease to work with. It's not going to stay just like when we did the X and the cross at the very beginning. It's just a kind of a crease to kind of say, here's the stopping point. I'm going to take this top triangle, and I'm just going to fold it down. It's not required, but I like to fold it the other way too, so I flipped it upside down and fold it back that way. And now, I don't know how well, yeah, you can see it. Now I have this crease on the top there. I'm not keeping it down, and you'll find that it won't want to stay down anyway. Okay, it'll want to pop up anyway. Mm -hmm. So we're folding down just like that. What's the next step? We're taking the top of folding it down. It's just crease. Okay. Is that what Excellent. Okay. Not to put too much stress on it, but this one I think is the hardest fold of all. Okay. You ready? Okay, so all the stuff we've done the past like three folds have kind of been set up for this next fold. So I'm actually going to open this all the way up and stretch it out. Okay. I'm going to take the right and left flaps, I'm going to open them up, and you'll see again I have that crease up here. I'm going to open this up, up to that crease, kind of stick my hands in there, go up to the crease, shove my finger in the corners a little bit, make sure it goes all the way to that crease, and open it all the way up. So now I have a rhombus. That looks like that. I am going to do this to both sides. So. Oh, we folded it. So these, the open side has to be at the bottom. So if we fold it this way instead. Yeah, you did it all right. It was just upside down. <laughs> there are actually variations to it. This is probably one of the more traditional ways, but there are slight differences. But since we folded it a couple times, it's going to be a little. And then do that to the other side. <laughs> No, you're good. Okay. You're good. Open it up. And I'm going all the way to that crease we made up here. And I'm all down. And just like that. And open it up. There. To the crease. And then you should. No problem. Love it. Looking great. Yes, we're going to be using those legs here soon. Perfect. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just not doing far enough. So there you go. If you just open it a little bit more. Yeah, the other side looks great. There you go. Okay. No problem. <laughs> oh, you fold it. Okay, so we're gonna have to fold it the other way. 
you made this the bottom, the open side of the bottom. So if you fold it this way, so I've done everything you already did, just flipped it up upside down. And now, since the open side is on the bottom, and now we have that to kind of us. So if you want to do it on the back side, open it up to that crease right there. Fold it back. Yeah, flipped it upside down, yeah. Looking good. Yeah, that looks, that looks great. Good, 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 good. Okay, excellent. So we're only a few folds away. Now it's just basically making the head and the tail. Let me catch up to y'all. I will do this, open it up. Yes, do it to both sides. Okay. So the little feetsies are at the bottom. The top doesn't have any feet. It's kind of one, one piece. I'm going to take my left and right sides and I'm going to fold them towards the center again. So this whole edge is going to go towards the center line again like I'm making a paper airplane. Yeah, it's getting tiny now. The folds are getting a little tight. We're making a tiny little triangle from the bigger one here. Click that corner, fold towards the center. Both sides, yep. And again, those little legs are at the bottom. We'll be done, I promise. <laughs> so, kind of towards the same. <laughs> Cranes. I mean, they're cute. They're definitely classic, but. You have to open up this one too. So now we got the feet, and we take it so this side goes towards the center. So kind of like a paper airplane that way, and we can all go to it. We do it on all four sides. Yes. That is looking great, and then you do it to the other side too. Like that. Yep. Okay. So now it's time to make the head and the tail. <laughs> Our little legs on the bottom here. You're going to flip them inside out. So I'm taking this leg. And I'm applying pressure to kind of the center of it to flip it inside out to make it go up and then reseal it. So I kind of make the little head. I'll do that again. My two legs are at the bottom here. I apply pressure to kind of the center of the flap. So that center that was in the middle there. Flip it up and refold it. So now it's facing upwards. I do the same thing with the back side. Flip it up. Oh. 
So I like to apply pressure in the center here, and so it flips it up. You're kind of like redoing the fold, but reverse. And it goes like that. There you go. Yeah. You're taking the legs and flipping them so we go so you're taking the little leg. The little legs are here. And you're putting them upside down. Just like that. If you can see the wings, you can fold them out and then you're done. You have the crane. I'll show you up here in a second. Yeah, yeah. So we got that. So I kind of apply pressure in the center and I flip it up. So now it's going up like that. So you're kind of like doing the same fold but in reverse, okay. making it go up like that. And then the wings. You just fold down. You take it from, put it there, take it down, put it there. And you have a crane. <laughs> so if we make it more like the paper airplane, like instead of just touching the center, I want the whole line on the center. <laughs> and then okay, so okay, here and here. Doing the same thing you just did will make that work. Much better. Where are you sending yours? Oh, that looks good. But where am I sending? So I typically let my students keep them, but if you want to be counted, just leave them at your desk and I'll add them to my final count. Where are you sending Oh, I don't keep them. I have my students take them home. Like I don't have the thousand in my office. I don't have a big enough office, so, so yeah. But no, I, I just keep a tally. Right. So again, if you want me to help kind of finalize yours, I can. If not, and you are done, thank you so much.